Good morning, church family, and my brothers and sisters in, in Christ. It's so good to um, be videotaping here with you all. Um, aren't the flowers beautiful in the spring that's blossoming? Even though we're in a 2020 pandemic and a flood, I know that God is real and he's good because he's in my heart and I see him every day. I'm so looking forward to getting together as a church body. I'm gonna have to be handcuffed before I enter because I'm a hugger. So I love you guys all. We, we love, love and you. miss you. See you later, folks. Hey, good morning, and welcome to Coleman Wesleyan Church's online services. I am so glad that you're here today. I'm Pastor Scott. Hey, Connie, thanks for that great greeting. Jaina, Autumn, and Asher, thank you for helping her with that. It is so good to see you guys. While you're here, would you do me a favor and just fill out a connection card? Let us know that you're here worshiping with us. We pray over each and every card that gets filled out. We want to pray God's blessing and God's favor. Everything that he has for you, we want to pray those over you. We want to pray for his Holy Spirit and his guidance and his comfort and his mercies that are new each and every day for you because that's what God has for us. While you're there, if you have a praise, share that with us. We would love to rejoice with you. Or if you are feeling a little pressed down, if you have some weight upon your shoulders, if you have a prayer request, let us know what it is and know with confidence that we will pray for you several times throughout the week. When you're done with that, if you want to shift over, there should be the tab right next to it or the button down below that right next to it that says giving. You can continue your worship through your giving if you click on that. That'll take you to our electronic giving where you can give your tithes and your offerings. We serve a very gracious, generous God, and he has shown his faithfulness through you guys. This past week, we have seen so much come in for the flood relief efforts, and that is helping us to, sh to share the gospel, to spread the, the good news, the joy that we have in Jesus Christ with people who right now um, are feeling a little less hopeful than uh, maybe you are in the comforts of your home, or maybe you uh, need some help. Let us know, and uh, we'll reach out to you, but it's all because of God's faithfulness and generosity that he chooses to show through us his people so continue your worship through your giving if you're not comfortable with electronic giving then you can still give your tithes and your offerings you can just mail that in to Coleman Wesleyan Church at 110 West Webster Street Coleman Michigan 48618 when you're done with that let's go ahead let's continue now then actually in worship through prayer would you bow your heads with me Gracious Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for all your goodness. Thank you for all that you do. Lord, you do mighty things, and you choose to, to use people sometimes to do those mighty things. God, you are doing some great works now through the, through the flood relief efforts, but Lord, would you help us? Would you sustain um, all of the volunteers for the, for the days, the weeks, and even the months and years yet to come to to bring full restoration to, to that area, to, to those homes, to the, to the places where these folks um, live. God, would you do a big work, I pray. Would you continue to show your generosity through the people? Would you continue to, to um, spur people on to, to share the good news through the practical works of, of uh, restoring these homes and these, these people's lives? But God, we also have some other things going on in our country. Lord, you know the, the, the social injustices that are happening. You know the, the outrage that is going on. Lord, would you help this not to divide our country any further? But Lord, would you, would you help it? Would you use it in such a way that it would bring an awareness to social injustice? Lord, would you um, use it in such a way that, um, that people would actually be brought together through healthy conversations? And God, would you help those that are, that are causing even actual further injustice through all the, through all the riots and all the, the destruction that is happening in the outrage. Lord, people are angry. Would you, would you grant your, your Holy Spirit to, to calm that anger because that doesn't come from you, Lord. Would you help that to be soothed and, and subside in such a way that, that, more, injust, that, that more injustice would, would would stop, that, that it would just all come to an end and that we could begin to heal, that we could begin to, to be um, restored back to, back to one another and, and to right fellowship really with you. God, do a mighty work, I pray, in, in, in Minneapolis, do a mighty work in, in Minnesota and, and God, really around the, the rest of the country. 
for Lord, you're the one who calls us to, to justice. You're the one who calls us um, really to, to peace. So Lord, would you grant your spirit now to bring those upon this nation, I pray, and help us to repent of, of any ways that, that we have that might not quite be of you. Lord, as we go forth into our daily lives throughout the remainder of this week, would you help us to carry that good news, not just to the flood victims, not just to those that are, that are angry about social injustice, but to our family, our friends, our co-workers, wherever it is that we go. Lord, would you help us to carry that good news that Jesus is Lord. And Lord, for those that have um, given of their, their tithes and their offerings out of, uh, out of obedience to your, your spirit, out of obedience to what it is that you're calling them to, Lord, would you bless those tithes? Would you bless these offerings, I pray, and use it so that others can come to know you as Lord and Savior? God, we pray this and all this we say, amen. We pray it in the name of Christ, amen. I have been out this week doing a lot of uh, flood relief type efforts. I have led some individuals and I've led some, some teams outward into the communities, into Sanford and into uh, Edenville and some of the, the townships around uh, to help to try and um, restore some lives because a lot of the folks there, their life got turned upside down, some very literally. Uh, others, they, they just see things in, in disarray. We have removed... Um, furniture and drywall and just a lot of various things out to curbs and out to dumpsters and and uh, people are, are feeling a little hopeless at times people are feeling a little numb and lost at times and uh, some people are far enough along in the process though it's it's still a long way off they can start to see um, the restoration process really um, begin to happen. They can see how their life is beginning to to be restored back to the reality that they were that they were used to. Um, but it's a process. It's a it's a long, lengthy process. It's going to take days. It's going to take weeks. It's going to take months and years, even for for some people or for some businesses to really get back to where they were if they're able to. Um, but maybe uh, maybe you um, have experienced that. Maybe you've experienced where your where your life was just kind of in disarray, and and you can relate to those folks who who have those those raw emotions. They they have um, a place where things are just really messy, and and the mess is kind of slowly going away. Maybe you can maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you've even been in the flood, or you were in these floods, uh, where you can you can see where. Um, walls were taken down to the studs and floors were, were cleared out of any, any carpet and, and you can begin to um, remember what it was like to, uh, to see where your belongings were supposed to, supposed to be and, and where the new belongings will go once the new drywall is up and, and you, maybe you remember what it was like um, uh, of experiencing how it should be. Uh, maybe you can't relate to that flood, um, that flood vision of, of sorts but maybe you've experienced something in your personal life, more in the sense of a relationship. Maybe it was a, a fight at home with a, with a family member or something. And, and oftentimes when we have those conflicts, when we have those times where uh, things just get a little, a little odd, a little different, um, we begin to fight with uh, loved ones and that, things tend to get pretty messy. Emotions uh, tend to get pretty raw, kind of like these flood victims. Um, their lives are a mess, their, their homes are a mess, their emotions are raw. So maybe you can relate to that. Maybe you can relate because you remember in, in that time where you had that fight, um, nothing really was how it, it, it should be. Uh, people that you used to talk to every single day, now all of a sudden aren't, you aren't talking to. Um, things just weren't as they, as they were and how they really should be. And, and over time, maybe you can remember if, if you were able to, and I, I, I hope you're able to, you're able to... Um, work through all the all the messiness you're able to work through um, all the all the pain and the raw emotions and and you started to put things back together again with that person uh, maybe you could see like the happiness and the joy begin to to be restored just like some of these folks they, they see that hope and that happiness um, beginning to be restored as as they see progress happen uh, maybe you remember um, glimpses of the future with that person you, were, you had um, that fight with. You saw the glimpses of the future where maybe things were, were going to be restored back to where they were or maybe even better. 
this is really what it what Paul is talking about. We've been walking through the the book of Colossians and and we're in the third chapter and we're really talking about things being restored. Last week Paul kind of showed us through scripture, at least through the the, the lens that we're looking at um, or looking through, the um, love needs to be restored because love isn't what it uh, what it is right now. The reality that we're living in isn't real. It's not the design that God had had created. It's it's flawed and it's eventually going to fade away and what's going to remain is the true reality. And so for us in Christ, uh, we who have accepted Christ, we have a new reality as a believer and that reality is that love is going to be restored and hearts are going to be restored but those things have to happen first. The heart has to has to be restored so that it can it can hold the love of Christ within us and, and be restored in such a way that there is no breach in the dam, there is no hole that will, will let it all flow out because once we are filled and it's restored in such a way that it can hold, hold that love, it's going to overflow on others as Christ continues to fill us with his love. And But Paul, as he talks about that in the, in the beginning of, the, of Colossians, of that, that uh, third chapter there, and, and we walked through that just last week, um, he then shifts. It, it seems what what seems to be a very radical shift um, is not so radical when we when we um, take a look at it. And so we're going to take a look at at the a few verses today. Um, we're going to take a look at verse eighteen through twenty one, and we we go out of the sense of of love and heart and love and heart being restored into he's talking about husbands and wives and and children, and it seems to be a radical shift, and yet it's not. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Let's see what, what Scripture says because he's really laying a big groundwork, a big foundation um, for our homes, having a restored home just like we're restoring for people out in the community. Would you, uh, would you turn with me to Colossians chapter 3? If you uh, have your phone, you can, you can open the Bible app or if you have your Bible, just open to Colossians chapter 3 and let's start reading in uh, verse 18. Wives, Submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. So what Paul is doing is something pretty interesting here. Let's break this down just a little bit. He starts out with, uh, with addressing the wives. He, he says, wife, submit yourself. In other words, he gives just one command to the wife. Then he goes on to the husband. And, and what he's done in just starting with the wife and going to the husband next is he's laid the foundation for all family units. The foundation is always going to be a wife and a husband, a husband and a wife. It's going to be man and wife together. That's, that was God's design, and Paul follows that very design with putting those two together first. Then he addresses children. But what also is notable is for the children, he gives just one command again. Uh, but for the husbands, he follows what he says to the children with yet another command. So the man gets multiple instructions. He gets, gets multiple commands while the wife gets one and the children get one. Now, I already know that if I were here or if you guys were here, that I probably would see some elbows getting, getting poked into some men's ribs and be like, yeah, because you got a lot wrong with you. I don't think that. I think that's really just because um, God is doing something, um, something special there for, for the men that, that help us get back to that original design. Because this is, as we've talked about, this is the new reality for being a believer in Christ. This is something different. It's not what we see now because what we see now is broken. The world is broken because of sin. And that sin entered in the garden. But before sin entered that garden, everything was perfect. And in that, uh, God had given multiple commands, multiple directions to Adam. Uh, and then Eve came along and Adam was to guide Eve. They were to subdue the world together by being subdued, by submitting then to God. And so he's done something pretty amazing here. Paul's done something pretty amazing by breaking this down into a family unit and starting with, with the wife and the husband. And so when he, when he talks then to the, to the wife, um, he says, listen, uh, you, are to, you are to submit to the husband. Wives, submit to your husbands as this is pleasing to the Lord. 
um, or this is fitting in the Lord. And women are like, oh, great, here comes that sermon. I have to submit. I don't like to submit. No, this is not one of those messages. This is, this is not the, the type of, of submission that is, that is like the, uh, being a, an army drill sergeant. In fact, if you really look up the, into the original language what submit means, it means much more like a, a subordinate, like a military. And you're like, well, great. Well, what's it, what's it really matter whether it's a drill sergeant or whether I'm subordinate like it being in the military? It's all someone lording things over me, but it's not. Think of it this way. Think of it much more like a battlefield commander. Wives are to submit like a, um, like a, a troop, uh, a, a soldier is to a battlefield commander. Because what does the battlefield commander really do? The battlefield commander looks out for their troops in battle. They, they look out for them. They look for, for the enemy to figure out where they're at so that they know how to um, try and, and protect their, their soldiers. They don't want to have casualties. Um, they, they plan um, where to go, what routes to take. They plan when to do these things. They're very thoughtful of, of the entire team because this is their family. They, they are brothers in arms. They're brothers and sisters in arms. So field commanders do some pretty amazing things. Field commanders know when to, when to push their soldiers and, and know when to give them some rest. They know, hey, we've, we've pushed them far enough and we need to give them some R&R. &R. We, we need to lay low for a couple days and, and uh, allow um, some rest to, to get back into our bodies so that we can go again. Uh, they push them. Uh, they, the field commander will push his soldiers. Uh, even when the soldiers don't see it within themselves, they, they know when to push them beyond uh, beyond themselves to help them to grow and help them to, to advance and do things that, that they never thought were possible. And it's all because the field commander observes and, and cares and, and sees things within that soldier that the soldier doesn't see within themselves. And so when, when a wife is to submit, she is to submit because God is then going to follow up. He's going to follow up with the husband and say, listen, you're going to be the field commander. And she's going to submit to you because this is fitting. This is, this is the proper thing to do. This is the fitting thing to do in the eyes of the Lord. So the second command then uh, that Paul is, is talking about here is the husbands are to love their wives. Now, men, we're not going to get all mushy here. We're not talking about flowers and we're not talking about chocolates and we're not talking about all the, all the things that we did when we, when we dated our wives. And, and listen, I'm not, just talking to, uh, I'm not just talking to men who are already married wives I'm, I'm, or ladies. I'm not even talking to, um, talking to you necessarily uh, as, as if you're a wife and if you're not, then this isn't relevant. Because maybe this is for, for you if you're planning on even getting married, whether you're, whether you're um, a female thinking about getting married, a male thinking about getting married. Um, these things are for you because this is, this is beginning to show us something. Uh, Paul is beginning to show us something of, of how this will all fit together. And so men, I'm not talking about this dating thing, though that, that's really important because we need to, we need to continue to, to date our wife and we need to continue to do the nice things that, that made them even want to marry us in the first place because we all know, hey, we're the hot mess. Remember, that's why we have more commands. Not really, but, um, but that's really what's going on is we, we learn about this love, not in the, in the mushy kind of way, but we learn what love truly is because what love does is love protects. And the, Paul, what Paul is saying is love your wife protect her from the dangerous situations, protect her from the harmful situations, because that's what love does. It, it protects those that, that we're in love with. We, we don't want any harm to come to them. Um, it provides for them. It provides things. Love will provide things uh, for us than when we can't provide them even for ourselves. Love um, gives rest when, when rest is needed. Love carries someone through uh, when they can't go on any further on their own and, and that love will, will carry them through. And so this is what Paul is saying is like, look, this is the type of love that I'm talking about. This is the love that is, that is action. This is the love that, that goes well beyond ourselves and is almost submitting to the other person. As he's already said, wives submit to your husbands. Love is, is a submission as well. And so he's, he's talking about all this and how it, how it fits together, but then he gives the man another command yet. It's not just to love your wife, but it, he also says not to be harsh with them. But this is really um, addressing something that's, um, 
in Roman culture at this point because in Roman culture, uh, wives were really looked at as property. They, they weren't looked at um, as, as something to, to be loved and to be cherished, but just as, as property. And children were looked at pretty much the same way. Uh, husbands were often uncaring for them. And so Paul is addressing a necessity within the culture, but he's also telling us, he's speaking to us now, because um, Scripture talks, um, was talking specifically to that culture, but it's God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so Scripture is still talking to, to us. And so we have to make sure that we're looking at this through a different lens. We're not looking at it through the current lens now. We have to first look at it through the perspective, through the lens of the time then, and see what it is saying to us. So he's saying, listen, um, you're not to, to treat your wife as just property, um, not to treat her harshly in such a way that, that you are uncaring, that you, that you just throw it off to the side, and if it breaks, you just get a new one. He's saying, listen, you can't do that. You are to love, to protect. You are to love and give rest. You are to, to love and, and provide. You, that's what love does. Um, but uh, oftentimes, like I said, they would, women would be looked at harshly as, as just property, the, that women didn't have rights, and, and we know that differently. We know, we know now that women absolutely have rights because they were both created, man and woman, were created in the image of God. Again, that's the original design. That's what it, that's what it was back in the garden. That is the true reality that we have, and what we have now, again, is just temporary and broken. And so we realize that women have rights, that, that they have equal rights to men because they're created equal in the eyes of God. But that wasn't the case back then. Their testimonies wouldn't even hold up in court. But Jesus, as he usually does, he flips everything upside down and on its end. Think about it. Think about that, that men would treat women like property and their testimonies wouldn't hold up in court. But who were the first to give testimony of Jesus' resurrection? It was the women. It was the women and the, and the authors that, that wrote the scriptures that talked about that. There was all God, it was all divinely um, given to them, but it was mentioned that the women gave testimony of the resurrection first. They were the first to witness it. That is a big thing to know in this. And so Paul is showing us that really this is not, um, this is not the way it's supposed to be. The way it's supposed to be is to love and to submit, to submit to one, uh, one another. Because what Paul is starting to do is show us um, an, an image of what the picture of Christ in his church really should be. That Christ is the groom and the, and the church is the bride. Now, men, don't get mad at me because I just called you a bride. Remember, we just said, or we have always said, that we are the church. You and I, we are the church. And if we're the church, the church is the bride. Again, don't get upset about that. Think about that. Think about what that truly means. Because that means that our groom, that means Jesus Christ. What does Jesus do? He is to love us. And that's what he does. Love protects. Think about that. Scripture tells us um, in many different places that, that, that he is our shield and he is our strong tower, that love protects, love provides. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Paul had laid that foundation already that, that it wasn't just Jesus, it was God Almighty, God who is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Jesus is both fully man and fully God. And so Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider, Love provides. Uh, love um, gives rest. Just like those field commanders, they know when those soldiers have to go on R&R. &R. Jesus knows when we need rest. Uh, scripture tells us, Psalm 23, uh, he makes me lie down uh, in, in green pastures. He leads me beside cool waters. He gives us rest. That's what love does. Um, he even says, Jesus himself even says, Come to me, all who are weary and weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That's out of, out of Matthew chapter 11. Come to me. I will give you rest. Love carries you when you can't, just like those field commanders. They, they push their soldiers when, uh, when they don't think they can go on any further. They push them um, because they don't see it in themselves, but the field commander does. Love does the same thing. Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ's love for the church carries us. 
Think about that. Christ strengthens you when you can't go on. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's Jesus. It's the love of Christ that strengthens us to help us to be able to even carry on. And so that's what Paul is starting to show is this image of Christ's love for us by, by showing us the image of what a husband should be and what a wife should be. But husbands, um, we had a few more commands, and, and sometimes it's because we, we understand love a little bit differently. We understand love in the, in the sense of respect. But we have to remember that the sense of, of, of respect is one that you have to, um, you have to show respect to receive it. You have to show that respect to receive it back. And ladies, you're part of that church, and therefore the same thing applies to you. Because oftentimes what was going on in this Roman culture is that because women were just viewed as property, they wouldn't respect their husbands at all. They would go and do whatever they could, uh, whatever they could get away with, because the, the husbands wouldn't respect them, but that's not showing respect in return. And so you have to show respect to receive respect, and part of that respect is just simply listening. If you want to be heard, you need to listen first. Scripture tells us uh, in, in other places in the, in the book of James, Jesus' brother tells us to be quick to listen and, and slow to speak. We need to listen and then be heard, and that's how we get respect. Love and respect, they go hand in hand. And all of this is what begins to restore those marriages, those marriages that are the foundation of the home. We want a restored home, we have to have a restored marriage. We want a restored marriage, we have to learn love and respect. We have to learn to submit. We have to learn to, to love in the way that, that God is showing us, the way that Paul is even talking about. That's why he starts with the wives and the husbands, but then he goes on. He goes on to talk about children. See, children are the offspring. They're the they're byproduct of what happens when you have that healthy wife and, and husband. Then the, the children will begin to obey their parents. That what, that's what he's saying. And who are children? If you're a child, raise your hand. I hope that all of you right now are raising your hand because you are, you are a child of someone, whether they're, whether they're here, whether they've passed, you are a child. And so all of us really need to listen to this. We need to listen to what Paul says that we are to then obey. We are to obey our parents. We are to obey what our parents say because they are, are being told that they are to submit and to love. Because we are the church. We are to do those things. And if our parents are doing them, then we should as well. The, the word obey means to submit the very thing that he is calling the wives to, to be subordinate, to do what they say. Um, there's a, in my home, uh, there's a time where I, I tell my, my kids, listen, uh, you need to learn to, to obey. You need to learn to obey the things that I say. Why? Because in the world... You're going to be you're going to you're going to be um, treated a little bit more harshly when you don't learn to obey here in a home. You're going to be treated even more harshly. Uh, if you don't obey the things that your boss asks you to do, then you're going to get fired. And we have those conversations to learn to obey and respect those authorities means that you need to start first in your house. Start first when, when you have those parents. Learn to, to obey then so that when you go out in the world, you know how to obey the authorities. That's really how God had designed it. Um, when, when God designed it, husband and wife and, and children, he said to be fruitful and multiply. He said that in, in Genesis, in the first chapter of Genesis. He said it in uh, Genesis 9, actually, also to Noah and his family to be fruitful and multiply. That's those children but we are to teach our children, and children, you are to learn this from your parents. You are to learn this even from Scripture, that you are to obey your parents, to be uh, submitted to them, to listen to them, to follow instructions, so that we can learn how then to obey authorities in our life. So learn it now when it's easy um, or easier so that you don't have challenges later in life. Maybe you're a little bit older now. Maybe you're, you're still a child because you're someone's child. But maybe that's something you need to work on. And Paul is saying, listen, this, is, this isn't just about your parents that may have already passed. This is really about authority and obeying authority. 
But the, the last verse here, and, and as we look at the, how this all works together to, to bring about a restored home, this is what he's shifted. We have to have the, the restored love. We have to have the container, the restored heart that can hold that love um, so that we can have a restored home. Everything in Colossians 3 really points to um, Paul talking about restoration. And so Paul continues on and he says not to embitter the children, not to, not to um, bring them down because children were, uh, in, in this Roman culture, were looked at as property. And what he is saying is, listen, you don't want to look at them as property. You don't want to, to correct every little wrong that they have because it, it puts them in a place where they don't want to respect you. They don't want to obey you. And so correct them in grace, correct them in love. Remember, you are to love your wife just as they are to submit to you. He uses so, uh, submit for the wife and obey as the children, but that, those are, are nearly the exact same terms. Therefore, the husband would need to love the wife and love the children, which means to guide and protect and not to, not to enrage a child, not to, not to make them um, downplayed where, where they feel defeated all the time. And when we do these, we begin to see the picture of the father, the true father. F fathers, don't embitter your children. But our father, our heavenly father, he doesn't do that. That's the example that we are to follow. If he doesn't embitter us, if he, if he then loves us as his bride, as his wife, if he then loves us as his child, how much more then should we respect him? How much more then should we obey? How much more then should we love him? Him who first loved us. That's what Paul is talking about. That's how we begin to have a restored home and a restored relationship with God the Father who loves us. Because that's the new reality of being a follower in Jesus Christ. You have a Father in heaven who loves you, who protects you, who guides you, who comforts you, who gives you rest when you need, who gives you protection as, as your shield and, and, and your strong tower, who gives you the things that you need even when you don't realize it. The, the, the one who can push you further than you ever felt you could go before because he's the one who gives you strength. That's our Heavenly Father and that's the image of, of Jesus Christ and his church. And that's how Paul wraps it all together to say this is restored love, restored heart, and restored home. Remember, Jesus loves you and so do I. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, God, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what it says about how we are to love, that men are to love their wives. They are to love their children. They are to, um, to help guide them and protect them, Lord, because that's what you do for us. And Lord, just as the wife is to submit to the husband, Lord, we are to submit to you. We are your bride. So Lord, help us to submit to you. Help us to obey your authority because we are your child. And God, would you show us then your glory? Would you show us all that it is that you have for us as we submit to you, as we obey you? And God, as we love you because you first loved us, help us to love others. Lord, help us to love others by sharing the good news that Jesus came to die for us so that we might live, so that we might gain. God, we pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember, Jesus loves you, so do I. Go forward this week and share that good news that he loves you. He loves your neighbor. He loves anyone that you come in contact with. Share that good news with them. Let them know that Jesus loves you. God bless. Have a great week in the Lord.